The Holy Spirit, as you know, is the third person of the Godhead that lives on the inside of us. We've already discussed God the Father and Jesus the Son, emphasizing that the unlimited power and resources these two bring, along with the work of the Holy Spirit, is what makes it possible for us to be within dependent. The state of within dependence means that we are able to draw from the unlimited support and resources of the Trinity from within for our help in every need. Now, the fact that the God, Godhead resides within us means that the help and resources we might need at any time are present and available to us right now. We're reminded of this, of this in uh, Psalm 46. You might want to go to Psalm 46. Verse 1 declares this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, with an emphasis on present. The help is present. It's available to us. Go to Psalm 27 and look at verse 1 there. Psalm 27. When you have it, say so you have it. 27 verse 1 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then drop down to verse 13 in Psalm 27, where it's made clear that the help and blessings of the Lord are for us in this present time. Verse 13 states this, I would have lost heart. Uh, one translation says, I would have fainted unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That means right now, not on the other side. Psalm 46 and Psalm 27 makes it clear what this series on with independence says about God and the full Godhead, and that is they are a very real and present help for us while we are living here on earth. The help is here and now. It is not in some distant future help or future place that we might see and get on the other side. Now, overall, we're talking about with independence that's made possible for all of us because everything we need in the way of resources and power already lives on the inside of us. If you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, what else is there? Everything is there. You know, the uh, ensemble just saying a little while ago that we have resurrection power within us. That's why we have resurrection power within us, because we have all three within us. Now, we tend to think of resurrection as only relating to coming back from the dead. But resurrection, the word comes from the root word that's the same as resurge or resurgence. It means that we have a creative resurgence of power to move from one plane to the other. Not necessarily just coming back from the dead. In other words, you can move from poverty to wealth. You can move from unemployment to employment. You can move from unhappiness to happiness. You can move from being alone to having who you would like around you. In other words, resurrection means you have the power of resurgence to move from one point to another, meaning a higher plane going to a higher place. That's because we have all of this power within us. That's what it means by greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world and that he's able to do abundantly above anything that we could think and ask or ask by the power and work within us. That's that power that's within us and it's within us at all times. Now, what this means is that we are not, in a practical sense, what it means is we are not and should not be dependent on the church or on a pastor or on some super saint who comes to town from time to time to provide us with the help that we need. And so many people cling to the church, like, the, you know, and, and I'll say some more about that in, in a minute. Apostle Price has always taught us that we already have the help that we need. When it comes to healing, for example, he always tells us that we can lay hands on ourselves. You don't have to wait. I mean, you could sit there and die waiting for somebody to come with hands. You have hands. All the requirement, the two requirements are to be a believer and you have hands. And that's you, or it should be. Lay hands on yourself. That's what I do. Now, this does not mean that we don't need the church. We always need the church because we always have new people 
and some old people who need teaching, who need information, who need knowledge, and so forth. There's always a need for that. And the word tells us not to forsake the assembling of uh, ourselves with one another. We need to be with people of like precious faith to share in our experiences, to provide support, mutual support, to get support ourselves, and to encourage one another. So we need the assembling of one another. My point is, because we have been deposited with all the resources we need, we are dependent on what we have within, and we're not dependent on a building, a pastor in a pulpit, or anything of that nature. So it doesn't mean that we don't need them. We don't, it doesn't mean that they don't provide a useful and proper service. It's just that we should not hang our life and future around an entity or a building. Because the Godhead is in us at all time, we say at the end of each service now that wherever I am, God is. Because wherever I am, God is there because God is with me, but not just with me, God is in me, and so forth. So the Holy Spirit that we're talking about is especially important, not that he's more important than God uh, and the Son, but he's important because the Holy Spirit has been given to us to abide with us forever in us to be our helper. That's our helper in whatever need, teacher, guide, advocate, intercessor, counselor, and so forth and so on. So we are exploring, as I said, the Holy Spirit. And we've already discussed question number one, which is who is the Holy Spirit? And question number two, which we're gonna to continue today, and that is how and when do we receive the Holy Spirit? Now, with respect to who the Holy Spirit is, we established from scripture that the Holy Spirit is in fact God, and it's God's Spirit, and as such is God. At the same time, we show that scripture, including words from Jesus himself, tells us that the Holy Spirit is a person, a divine person. Now, you'll need to get the CD or DVD of these two messages to have a fuller understanding of what we just established. Today, I want to review with you again some of the things that were covered last time about the vital role of the Holy Spirit in our salvation and regeneration. Turn with me to 1 John. That's the first epistle of John. And go to chapter 5 and look at verse 7. That's little John next to Revelations. When you have it, say, I have it. That's 1 John. Uh, Verse 5, I mean 1 John 5, 7, which records this. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Word we know as the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. This is the Godhead, the Trinity, and they all work together to achieve a desired goal or to bring about a desired result, especially a desired goal in terms of us personally, a desired goal and result in our lives. Now, we see throughout scripture from the beginning with creation in Genesis that the three work together, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in fact, in verse two of Genesis, you see where the Holy Spirit is hovering over the firmament. And it's the Holy Spirit that's scoping out what's later to be established and so forth. Uh, Early in this lesson, I described the Holy, Holy Spirit as the workhorse or power engine of the Godhead. Now, I like what Apostle Price says about the three. And uh, you may have read this before. I'm, I'm not sure. You may, you may never have heard this. But this is what Apostle Price says. He says the Godhead functions like a corporation. God the Father is president and chief executive officer. Jesus is executive vice president and director of operations. The Holy Spirit is the field representative. While Jesus and the Father stay and issue orders from corporate headquarters in heaven, the Holy Spirit goes into the earth realm to carry out those orders. That's why I say the Holy Spirit is so important because the Holy Spirit is here to work with us through issues that we have here in the earth realm. That's why the Holy Spirit actually is the most important person in the earth realm. Now, when it comes to our salvation, I describe the work of the Trinity this way, which I did last time. God ordained our salvation, Jesus delivered our salvation, and the Holy Spirit sealed our salvation. To repeat, God ordained, Jesus delivered, 
Holy Spirit seal our salvation. So we know that God ordained and set in motion the promise of salvation and redemption and that Jesus was the messenger who delivered and made good on that promise by his sacrifice at Calvary, which we commemorated today with communion. Now, what we're not always clear about is the role the Holy Spirit plays in our salvation and redemption and when this role is carried out. That is why we ask the question, how and when do we receive the Holy Spirit? Actually, probably should put in there, how and when do we first receive the Holy Spirit? We get the answer to the question when we fully understand the role of the Holy Spirit at and in our salvation, at and in our salvation. To get this understanding, it's necessary to go over again some salvation basics, which we began last time. And these are very basic, by the way. We know that the ordaining of our salvation was begun by God after Adam's fall in the garden, and that this plan for man's salvation was set in place in the book of Genesis. Jesus sums up the Father's actions in John 3.16. And you can take a look at that. You know it by heart, John 3.16, where he, Jesus, tells us this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to whoever believes in him, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, let's examine this again as we did last week, but just maybe a little bit differently uh, this morning. The scripture says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, just what does believing in him, believing in Jesus mean, and what is everlasting life? Now, the reason that I'm focusing on this point, first of all, it was established in John 3.16, is that it is so important what we believe. What we believe about Jesus is what triggers our salvation. What we believe about Jesus is what triggers the advent of the Holy Spirit into our life. You get that? What we believe and what we express, and I'll explain this. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. I don't want to put an S on that. Matthew chapter 15, verses 13 through 17. Let's take a look at that. When you have it, tell me you have it. Starting at verse 13, it says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? 14, so they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the, other, one of the prophets. And he said to them in verse 15, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered in the next verse, 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him in verse 17, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And then you should go on and read the rest of it because it, that's where he says that it's upon this rock that I build my church and so forth and so on. And it's been interpreted, as you know, by a large denomination as that the, the rock is Peter, that he's building his church on Peter. No, he's building it on the revelation knowledge that Peter just gave us, that Jesus is the Christ. That's the difference. Now, but what I want you to note for our lesson today is this. Look at verse 15, where Jesus asked the disciples to say who they think he is. And in so doing, he's asking them to make a verbal statement about their belief. Now, he didn't ask them to, you know, think about this and send me a note later or write it in the, in the sand. He said, who do you say I am? Verbal. Note also in verse 16 that Simon Peter answers and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter said, it's important. Now, this is glossed over most of the time, but I want you to see the importance of Jesus demanding a verbal audible response in receiving it from Simon Peter because it's this request by Jesus and the response by Peter both verbal that lays the foundation for what the Apostle Paul establishes in the salvation scripture in Romans 10 9 and that is if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you know the rest in other words Paul is drawing from what Jesus did in Matthew 15, and Jesus, of course, is drawing upon what he saw the Father do. And what did the Father do? Create the whole universe by speaking it into existence. We're to speak what we believe if we really believe it and if we want to see it come into existence. 
you must verbally say it. Believing in Jesus means that you believe what Simon Peter believed and expressed in, uh, to Jesus in Matthew 15, 16, which we just read. You believe that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of God. Now, you have to know what the Christ means. Now, this is mainly for beginners, but maybe some not so beginners uh, need to hear it again. What does the Christ mean? The Christ is the same as the Messiah. And Messiah comes from a Hebrew word which means the anointed one of God, the Savior, Redeemer, Deliverer. God ordained our salvation and redemption and Jesus was a messenger who brought the good news to mankind. By way of further understanding, you should know that the word and the name Jesus means, who knows what Jesus means? Jesus means God is salvation. God is salvation. And it comes by way of the Hebrew word, Yeshua, like Joshua. I'll spell it for you. It's spelled in several different ways, but the way I have it here is J-E-H-O-S-H-U-A. Yeshua, like Joshua. Jesus comes from that Hebrew word, and that Hebrew word means Jehovah is salvation. So Jesus means God is salvation. So his very name means that God is salvation. He's bringing that message to us here, or he brought that message to us here on earth. So Jesus the Christ is the anointed one of God, the Messiah, who delivered the message of salvation and redemption to all mankind. As I said, his very name means God is salvation. It's very similar to uh, another name for the Messiah, which you know, and that's Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us, exactly. Now we just said what the name of Jesus means. It's important also, and this is very, very elementary, but you'd be surprised that some people don't know this. It's important to not think of Christ as the last name of Jesus. S. Smith or Jones is the last name of people today. Let me tell you a true story. After a crusade meeting led by a prominent national religious leader, who was discussing the very subject of the Christ, a lady came up front to greet him and said to him, I always thought that Jesus Christ was the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. I suppose she was thinking of Joseph and Mary Christ. This is actually what she thought. Christ is not a last name, it's a title. That's why it really is Jesus the Christ. I say usually Christ Jesus. Again, this is very basic. But it's the same thing as saying William the Conqueror, Alexander the Great. We wouldn't change William's name to William Conqueror and Alexander Great as being their names. It's the same way with Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Christ is Jesus the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the Redeemer, the Deliverer. And when we believe in him, we are expressing our belief in him as a Messiah, as Simon Peter said the Christ, the Savior, our Lord. And it's that belief that causes our salvation and confers on us everlasting life. It's that belief, the expression of that belief. And so it's very important that you believe it, but also know what you're believing, and so forth. And that's why I'm taking the time to go over this really rudimentary explanation, which I'm sure that 99.9% .9 of you know, but then again, information and faith both come by hearing, and hearing and hearing so forth, so you can't hear it too much. Now again, it's the Apostle Paul who makes it clear that we must make a personal, audible expression of this belief and acceptance of Jesus as our Lord and Savior in the familiar scripture found in Romans 10, 9, which I mentioned earlier. But remember, I'm saying he draws this from what Jesus insisted on hearing from his disciples. So Romans 10, 9, you know that you can go there if you want. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's the confession with your mouth and believing in your heart uh, that triggers salvation. Romans 10, 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, unto salvation. Now, when a person believes in his, in his heart that God raised Christ from the dead 
and confesses Jesus as his personal Savior and Lord, and this is important, listen to this, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God come together in that person, meaning inside that person, to carry out their joint mission. This mission is twofold. And this is repeating what I just said, but I want to make sure you know it loud and clear. The one mission is salvation and redemption from sin through the precious blood of the Lamb, Jesus. This is the mission of the Word, the Son. And the second mission is the new birth of our recreated spirit. That's what being born again is. It's the new birth of our recreated spirit. Uh, remember, we're spirit, uh, as, as I told you last time and so forth, and I'll mention this a little bit later. That is what being born again means, and it is the work of the Holy Spirit. So often, everybody thinks that if you just confess Jesus and you receive salvation, that that means that you're born again, meaning the new spiritual birth. No, it takes the Holy Spirit to bring about the new birth, and I'll explain that. In fact, go to 1 John, that's little John again, chapter five, look at verse one. And it really tells you in that one statement there, go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, because you need to see this. And it doesn't need any clarification. What it states is very clear. 1 John 5, 1, are you there? It says, whoever believes that Jesus is a Christ is born of God. Born of God means born of his spirit. That's why I'm saying it's so important what we believe. You believe that Jesus is a Christ, as Simon Peter said, then you are born of God's spirit. And I said, we'll discuss this uh, a little bit later. Now, at the instant the person is born again, I mean, I, I should say at that instant a person is born again, and when you do what Romans 10, 9, 10 says for, you then become a child of God as promised. In John, that's the Gospel of John, uh, chapter one, verse 12 and 13, Go take a look at that again. That's John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. And you know this. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. You, you, you can go there. That's the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. It says, but as many as received him, that is, received Jesus as the Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. We become a child of God by believing that Jesus is the Christ. And that happens in salvation and so forth. Now this belief and acceptance that Jesus is the Christ leads us to salvation and takes us to the role of the Holy Spirit in our salvation. And that role is rebirth and regeneration. This role is set forth clearly uh, uh, throughout scripture in the New Testament. And Paul is one who does an excellent job of this. But it's actually made very clear in one verse from Titus. Go to Titus, chapter 3, verse 5. Titus, I think, is after uh, 2 Timothy. You need to see this. We looked at it last time, but you need to revisit it again. That's Titus, chapter 3, verse 5, which reads, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now let me read you this uh, out of the Amplified Bible. It puts us this way. It says, he saved us not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but because of his own pity and mercy by the cleansing bath of the new birth, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. The new birth comes to pass by the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what you need to clearly understand. I'm not sure that everybody has always understood that. This is a rebirth and renewal of our spirit within that takes place at salvation, and it is, as I just said, the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, this is what it means to be born again, to be born of God, to be born from above, to be born of a spirit. Being born of God is being born of the Spirit of God. And this rebirth uh, springs from our belief in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. Now, we already went to 1 John 5, 1, which clearly tells us this, that whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And he goes on to say, everyone who loves him, that's God, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. 
Now let me read this to you out of the Amplified, because I agree with um, Elder Iva. Amplified message and some of the others sometimes make it clear. Amplified, same verse, 1 John 5, 1 John 5, verse 1 says this, everyone who believes, adheres to, trusts, and relies on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, is born, is a born again child of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him, his offspring. Now, the reason I like this because what this is telling us is that we always think that just simply means that if we love God, we love his only begotten Jesus. What this means is that we must love his offspring. That's all the children of God who are in his family by way of salvation and so forth. So start speaking to that person that you stopped speaking to here six months ago. I was glad when Ella Iva said, come closer together because some people seem to need like five chairs on either side of them, vacant and so forth and so on. We're to love one another. We're to love one another. So being born of God is being born of God's Holy Spirit. Jesus makes it clear, and this is what I want to go over with you, that being born again is impossible without being born of the Spirit. Look at John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and look at verses 5 and 6. Very familiar scripture, but I want to make sure you, you get the context here. John, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Now, you know the story of Nicodemus who came and asked, what, what must I do? to be saved and so forth. Anyway, verse five says this, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Six, and this is important, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Now what Jesus is reminding us of here is that everything reproduces after its own kind. Flesh reproduces flesh, spirit reproduces spirit. For our spirit, to be born again or to be recreated, it has to be done by another spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Now, look at verse six that we just read. In this verse, you notice that the first time the word spirit is used, it is capitalized, indicating what? It's the Holy Spirit. Second time spirit is used, it's in a lowercase because it's referring to the spirit of man, you and me. When we accept Jesus as Christ as Lord and Savior, we are immediately born of God's Holy Spirit, as we are told in 1 John 5, 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now, that is to say, we are born of God's image and likeness of Spirit. And the Spirit enters our heart and begins that work of rebirth and renewal and regeneration of our spirit. That's why we always point out that when you're born again, it's our inner man, it's our spirit man that's born again, not us, not us. And I think Elder Iver said this last week, when you're born again, if you were bald-headed before, you're going to be bald-headed afterwards. If you couldn't see before, you won't be able to see after, and so forth and so on. In other words, our body does not change, even though we have the scriptures that talk about, and behold, all things are new. No. Now, but by the way, it is the work of the Holy Spirit within in terms of regeneration, that work is to help bring on the inside of us to the outside and so forth. Now, uh, this is both when, I'm saying at this point of salvation, being born again, this is both when and how we first receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That answers the question, how and when it's at salvation when we're born again. That's when the Holy Spirit first enters into our hearts and becomes the indweller within. Now, as I reminded you last week, we are a spirit, and it is that spirit. Let me turn the page. It is that spirit. That spirit, our spirit, that's quickened or made alive by the work of the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. We are saved and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the precious blood of the Lamb. But the Holy Spirit is the one who makes a new birth possible, and I shouldn't put it this way. We are saved and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb 
and the Holy Spirit is the one who makes the new birth possible. They are working together. This initial indwelling of the Spirit, uh, this, uh, this initial indwelling of the Holy Spirit at the moment of, of salvation is spoken of by the Apostle Paul who writes in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 13. Go there, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Here he writes, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, the body of Christ, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Here Paul is teaching us that we receive the Holy Spirit the moment we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. All born again believers have one spirit indwelling, and that is the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit not only causes the new life or new birth to come to pass, but it also seals our salvation, and it seals the promises of God as a guarantee to us until the day of redemption. I spoke about this last week. Uh, based on some questions I got, everybody was not clear on what this sealing was all about in the guarantee. Uh, this is the other role of the Holy Spirit in our salvation and inheritance. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verse 13 and 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. When you have it, till you have it. Starting at verse 13, it says, In him, meaning Jesus, you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that's the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you believed in this gospel of salvation, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit of promise, it's sealing us and guaranteeing to us the promises of God. That's eternal, everlasting life with him and all the other promises as his child and so forth. The Holy Spirit seals that when he comes in at this first instance and indwells uh, in our hearts and so forth. Now, let's look at this in the Amplified. Oh, by the way, let me, let me read you verse 14. What that seal is, it tells you what it is in 14. Verse 14 says, who is the guarantee, meaning the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. The purchased possession is us. The inheritance, inheritance is the inheritance of salvation and all the other promises of God and so forth. So in the Amplified, it renders Ephesians 1, chapter 13 and 14 this way. It says, in him you also have heard the word of truth, the glad tidings, the gospel of your salvation. You have believed in and adhered to and relied on him you were stamped with the seal of the long-promised Holy Spirit. That spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance, the first fruits, the pledge and foretaste, the down payment on our heritage in anticipation of its full redemption at our acquiring complete possession of it to the praise of his glory. And we acquire full possession of it on the day of redemption. Now, what is the day of redemption? Before I go there, let me just say this. It's in the present time that we're redeemed, bought out of sin, and have our sins forgiven when we are baptized into the body of Christ of salvation. We have the promise of salvation, which is eternal life with God, and all God has planned for us in the future, sealed and guaranteed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Now, the term seal is used in the same way, as I said last week, that a seal is used on a will or some other legal document to guarantee its binding effect. And the best way I can do this is to bring to mind what you've seen in books and you've seen it in movies where they have this wax seal that's usually red and it's warm and it's stamped and sealed. Sometimes it seals an envelope or letter. But at the end of documents, it's sealing the letter to guarantee its content, meaning the writer of that document is guaranteeing its contents. That's what the seal means. Uh, similarly, the Holy Spirit seals our salvation, eternal life with God, and all the promises that belong to the children of God with this guarantee until the day of redemption. Now, to understand the day of redemption is that day in the future, no one knows when we will all be resurrected, changed, and receive our resurrected bodies. Now, no one knows, but I want you to go to this scripture 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look at verses 51 52. I usually do this at memorials, but it's applicable here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look at verses 51 52. It shows that this day of redemption could happen at any moment. This is what we have recorded there. It says in 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That will be the day of redemption. And the fulfillment of the promises of God to his children, the promises of which have been sealed at salvation by the Holy Spirit of promise. We're told this in another scripture. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at verses 21 and 22. Now I'm going, I know I covered most of this last week. I'm going over it again, hopefully, to make sure that everybody gets it. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 and 21, which says this. 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. That's the Holy Spirit who entered our heart when we're born again, seal our salvation and seal our inheritance and so forth. Now, to make this point again, uh, we're told that because of the great work that the Holy Spirit has done, and we should not bug or get on the nerve of the Holy Spirit, we're reminded of this in Ephesians 4, verse 30. Take a look at that. You've heard the scripture before. Ephesians 4, 30, which says, are you there? Ephesians 4, 30 says this, and do not grieve that's bug, annoy the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, to make this point again, which I made earlier in this lesson, your body becomes a temple of God, referred to in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, and a temple of the Holy Spirit from the moment you express belief in Jesus as the Christ and are born again. To summarize, when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, you receive Christ into your heart. You are now baptized into Christ and become a child of God. At the same moment, the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, comes and joins with your spirit as a new believer and begins the work of renewal and regeneration from within, which is mentioned in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, which we went over already. <clears throat> this is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within you that happens at the point of salvation. At this point, as I said last week, your spirit can now have dialogue with God's spirit. You have to remember that God only relates to our spirit, the real you and me. And I talked about the true nature of our being last time. We are a tripartite being, that is, spirit that has a soul and lives inside a body. We see this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 32. This is a scripture you should write down and know because when people say, what do you mean that you're a spirit and have a soul and live in a body? You can show them this in scripture. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 32. At this point, as I said, uh, God's spirit can have dialogue with your spirit. Uh, now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 32 says this. Now may the God of peace himself... Oh, 533. That's why I'm, I'm thrown off. Oh, 523. That's the typo here. That's why I couldn't see it. Okay, 523. So it means that you actually went there. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Now, as I said last time, and I'm going to say it again today, when we think about ourselves as humans, we tend to think that we are a body that has a spirit, but it's quite the opposite. We are a spirit that has a body. And God only relates to that spirit. 
as I just said, when you are born again, the Holy Spirit immediately enters your heart and begins to have dialogue with your spirit. And we see an example of this in Romans 8, 16. Romans 8, 16. Romans 8, 16 says this. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, the conversation is between Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, and Spirit, small s, that's our spirit. Now, what I've been talking about thus far with respect to the Holy Spirit at salvation is the indwelling of the Spirit. All believers receive this indwelling of the Spirit uh, uh, when they're born again. And as I said before, the Holy Spirit abides with us and is in us and will be with us forever as our helper, comforter, teacher, guide, and advocate and intercessor as Jesus promised. That is the promise that Jesus made at the Gospel of John or in the Gospel of John. That's chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. You can mark it down. Now, we're going to examine in greater detail the many functions of the Holy Spirit when we get to the question number four, what is the work of the Holy Spirit? But before we go there, we're going to, in this last two minutes that we have, move to question number three, which asks, what is the difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which happens, which happens in salvation, and the baptism, or being filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, in discussing the difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and being filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the disagreements that exist among church denominations. Let me just say this. Some, some denominations believe that there is only one inflow of the Holy Spirit. That's the indwelling at the time of salvation. They consider this the filling and the baptism all in one. And they say there's no need after this initial inflow of the Holy Spirit for any subsequent filling or, uh, filling or baptism. They say that what took place on the day of Pentecost, which you're familiar with, uh, in the book of Acts, was a one-time experience which was only for the disciples at that time in that day. It was a one-time experience. But let me make sure you understand this. When you look at scripture, uh, it reveals some interesting things. And as I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but let me just say this. The position of this ministry founded by Apostle Price is that, that there is a distinct difference between the Holy Spirit indwelling us and the Spirit filling us when we are baptized with the Spirit. Now, what I'm going to do, and I'll, I'll actually pick this up next time because we're actually out of time, but we're going to examine the baptism of the Holy Spirit in some detail, and we're going to show you why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is important, necessary, and distinct from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We now offer the convenience of text and online giving, one of the most secure ways to give. Try it now. Simply text East G from your smartphone to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, or East O for offering. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, BrentrawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This experience is easy to use, secure, and requires a one-time registration only. Giving the second time is even easier. Simply text East G to 28950 with all your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return in your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight.
we would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K. C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting EAST AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.